Warning, this video is a parody. All scientific concepts and calculations are fabricated bullshit. Attempting to recreate will be unsuccessful and potentially deadly. Watch until the end unless you want to be confused. I'm standing here on this hill, nearly five miles away from my bedroom, where my uranium is sitting on top of my stir plate. With the click of this button, the stir plate will start stirring and my uranium will detonate just a few moments later. Cameraman, give me a countdown. Three, two, one! I'm standing here on Oppenheimer Way at the University of California, Berkeley, just a few paces from the buildings where Oppenheimer himself once worked. Today, I'm gonna step into his shoes to show you exactly how he made the world's first nuclear bomb. By making it myself. The first thing you're gonna to need to make a nuke is some uranium. When the Manhattan Project was first announced, Leslie Groves ordered 1,200 tons of uranium on the first day. So I went to Amazon to order my uranium. And I knew in order to get 1,200 tons, I would need to order a lot of it. But for some reason, I could only max out at 79 orders. But then I realized, unlike Oppenheimer, I was broke. And buying 79 orders of uranium at $50 each would cost me over $4,000. An idea that was a bit too foolish, even for me. So I stuck with just buying one. The uranium arrived in the mail a few days later, and now I could get to the hardest step, enriching it. This is a step where my method might deviate a bit from what Oppenheimer did. Normally, to enrich uranium, we'd have to use massive mass spectrometers to separate the uranium-235 by weight. Unfortunately, I didn't have access to such devices, so I had to enrich my uranium using a process I invented myself, which I call uranium fenrichment. A wordplay on foolish and enrichment. It's a pretty complicated and long process, so I'll run through it pretty quickly. First, we take a beaker and pour in a small amount of hydrochloric acid. Then we start to heat it up so the acid vapors fill the beaker. And once it's heated enough, we add some water. This was the easy step. Now, we need to add our uranium to our beaker. And once we do that, we have exactly 6.9 seconds to add 69 more ingredients in the right proportions. Otherwise, the fenrichment will fail. So now, I drop in the uranium, and the clock begins. I dump in some potassium chloride, some sodium acetate, then add a mixture of all the chemicals listed here, a small amount of the aluminum phosphate I made in one of my previous videos, and as the final and most important ingredient, a slice of banana. And just like that, bam, we have our enriched uranium. The way this works is simple. Uranium ore contains a lot of impurities and the hydrochloric acid vapors begin selectively extracting the elemental uranium from the ore the moment we drop it in the beaker. This is where the clock starts ticking. Uranium contains two main isotopes, 238 and 235. We want uranium-235 because that's the radioactive one. For a small amount of time when the elemental uranium is first extracted by the acid, the 238 isotope sinks below the 235 isotope because it's heavier. However, given enough time, the uranium isotopes will mix together, and it will be impossible to separate the two isotopes. I take advantage of this by adding a bunch of coagulants that attract uranium-238, but not 235, and help us sink to the bottom. Then, I add the banana. This is the most critical ingredient, because bananas contain potassium-40, a radioactive isotope of potassium. Because potassium-40 and uranium-235 are both radioactive, they attract each other, since like attracts like. And since the slice of banana is so light, it stays on top of the beaker. So I isolate the uranium-235 at the top of the beaker. 
Now that we have the enriched uranium, I need to figure out how to use it to start a nuclear fission reaction. According to this Veritasium video, the way nuclear weapons are detonated is by combining uranium into a chunk that exceeds its critical mass. In other words, if we just get enough uranium in one place, it'll explode. The way that nuclear weapons do that is by getting two pieces of uranium and then shooting them at each other so their combined mass is greater than the critical mass. This was the first idea that Oppenheimer had as well. But unfortunately, the critical mass of uranium is 52 kilograms. The amount I had here weighed only 0.8 pounds, which is about 0.36 kilograms. That means I only had 0.69% of the mass of uranium I needed to reach critical mass. Luckily, there's a way to get around this. The nuclear weapon that Oppenheimer made didn't actually shoot two pieces of uranium at each other. This ended up being infeasible. As Veritasium explains, the critical mass of uranium necessary to start a fission reaction is dependent on the density of the material. So in a way, the critical mass is really a critical density. Now, Veritasium explained this in his video with plutonium, but it should be the same idea with uranium. So what Oppenheimer did was he made a reactor that uses conventional explosives to rapidly condense a small amount of plutonium to its critical density, causing a nuclear reaction to start. Unfortunately for me, I don't have any explosives I can use to compress the chunk of uranium down to its critical density. But I do have a stir plate, which I can use to accomplish the same thing by spinning the uranium. Stir plates use a magnetic field to spin magnetic stir bars. Luckily for me, uranium is also highly magnetic, so it should spin in the same way. When the uranium starts spinning about its center axis, its outer layers experience a very strong centripetal force, a force that all objects in circular motion experience. This centripetal force points towards the center axis of the uranium rock, and this compresses it inwards. This compression should increase the uranium's density past its critical density, so a nuclear reaction should begin. I can confirm this with some calculations. This stir plate can spin a large stir bar at a rate of 1000 revolutions per second, which is 2000 pi radians per second. By the formula for centripetal force, this should produce over 50,000 newtons of force, more than enough to adequately compress the uranium. Now that we have the nuke ready to go, I just need somewhere to test it. Oppenheimer himself loved New Mexico, and that's exactly why he decided to nuke it. That's why, to remake the bomb exactly as he did, I'm going to nuke a place I love. My bedroom. I'm standing here, on this hill, nearly five miles away from my bedroom, where my uranium is sitting on top of my stir plate. With the click of this button, the stir plate will start stirring, and my uranium will detonate just a few moments later. Today, I have shown you how Oppenheimer made the world's first nuclear bomb. And together, we're going to experience its detonation, just as Oppenheimer did nearly eight decades ago. <sighs> Cameraman, give me a countdown. Three, two, one. Whoa! Oh my, my camera down there must be incinerated. Wait, dude, wasn't that your house? Yeah, what of it? Dude, your house. Oh, sh According to the lore, from that point on, foolish chemists became homeless chemists. Okay, wait, 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 wait. We can't stop there. I just gave you a completely fake video with a whole bunch of bullshit, along with some truth mixed in. And a lot of you are probably really confused about which parts are real and which are fake. So for the last few minutes here, I'm going to spend some time and clarify all of the bullshit things I said so that you guys aren't confused about the chemistry, physics, and math concepts involved in making nuclear weapons. 
And by the way, you can't make any at home, so don't try to. But first, let's start with the history. At the beginning of the video, I claimed I was standing on Oppenheimer Way at UC Berkeley. Well, I was at UC Berkeley, but I wasn't on Oppenheimer Way. I was right in the middle of the College of Chemistry. The reason I didn't film on Oppenheimer Way is that there were simply too many people walking up and down there. Though this b-roll was of the physics building and was actually taken on Oppenheimer Way, but I have no clue if Oppenheimer's office was in here at any point. I just know it was a physics building because it was conveniently labeled so. I guess creativity isn't one of the physics department's strengths. Now let's get to the scientific parts. This statement, when the Manhattan Project was first announced, Leslie Groves ordered 1,200 tons of uranium, is true. But the next part where I buy the uranium is bull****. I didn't buy anything, and this piece of uranium is literally just a random rock I found outside. The fenrichment process I described is also complete bull****. I literally just made it up on the spot mixing together any random chemicals I had on hand that wouldn't adversely react with each other. I wasn't even expecting anything to happen to this rock. The fact that it began dissolving was a complete accident. And this mixture of the chemicals listed on the screen was actually just more potassium chloride. My explanation of the process was also completely fabricated. None of the scientific concepts I presented are true, especially this like attracts like claim. The idea that like attracts like applies to the mixing of polar and nonpolar compounds, and that's about it. It definitely doesn't apply to radioactive isotopes. Also, if you were paying close attention, you would have realized that it actually took me way longer than 6.9 seconds to add everything, so even by my own fabricated methods, I should have failed. To my knowledge, it's not even possible to chemically isolate uranium isotopes. My explanation of how nuclear weapons work was mostly true, only because I got all my info on that topic from the Veritasium video. This includes the part when I explained that the Manhattan Project used conventional explosives to rapidly condense plutonium to detonate. This is somewhat accurate. However, my idea of spinning the uranium to condense it is almost complete bullshit. First of all, uranium is not magnetic, so the surplate won't do anything to it. Second, even if uranium was magnetic, and I could spin it, the surplate absolutely cannot spin at 1000 revolutions per second. Finally, the idea that if I spun the uranium super fast, it would condense under its centripetal force is completely wrong. Though it's true that centripetal force points towards the axis of rotation, this force acts continually to change the direction of an object to keep it in circular motion. It doesn't compress the object it's more likely that the uranium rock would actually flatten because its outsides experience an out force. Similar to how when you're spinning on a merry-go-round, you feel as if you're going to fly outward off of it. As a disclaimer, this is only sort of a hunch I have, and I could also be wrong about this as well. The only part of this that is correct is the way I wrote the formula for centripetal force. Though again, none of it applies to the situation, both conceptually and mathematically. And yeah. That's uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Um, now we can roll the outro.